Thank you very much to everybody for attending this exciting um, webinar in, in terms of the innovation and strategy in times of crisis and how banks are responding to COVID-19. So thank you very much to MKB FinTech Lab for um, approaching us and, and working with us on this. Um, and we're very delighted to have all of you here today. Um, and some of the speakers, we're, go we're gonna kick off today with uh, our good friend, Stefan Osthaus, the founder of Experience5, who will run through a uh, background of, of how he has been dealing with it and speaking with other banks across the country. Um, across Europe, actually, and, and how to deal with it. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Daskiewicz, our Chief Innovation Officer of Alior Bank. Jano, Janos Perisitz, of the Managing Director of uh, the Digital Business of MKB Bank. Nigel Owen, um, is Communications and Strategy Consultant. And Mary Alcantara, who is the Director of MKP FinTech Lab. And I will pass it over to Mary to take things forward from here. Great, thanks Mark, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, and we'd like to have this session as interactive as, as possible um, while respecting everybody's, uh, you know, wanting to not, not have too much noise in, in the camera. Um, so if you have any questions at any point, anybody who's in the attendees list, please go ahead and use the chat function in Zoom and we'll be keeping track of those and we wanna give you time at the end of the panel. We wanna leave at least 10, 15 minutes to talk about your questions, if not more. If we see more coming in, then we'll try to leave more time. Um, so yeah, like Mark said, my name is Mary Alcantara. I'm the Deputy Managing Director at MKB FinTech Lab. We're an innovation lab and design competence center owned by MKB Bank based in Budapest, Hungary. And I'm really excited for today. We're going to be talking about how banks are responding to the COVID-19 crisis and the impact of innovation and strategy in these times. Um, we have a good range of perspectives here, two representatives from leading um, banks that, uh, in the region and two subject matter experts who can bring in some best practices on strategy and how customer insights can really guide you in times of crisis especially. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to kick it off. We're gonna hear from Stefan Osthaus. Uh, he's gonna give us a little bit of an intro presentation for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll start in with the panel. So Stefan, take it away. Very good, thank yes, you for that. Good afternoon, that. everyone. <clears throat> good afternoon from sunny Dusseldorf in Germany. And my role today will be to share a little bit of uh, inter-industry um, uh, best practice is here from our work with clients around the world. I summarized a model on what we saw our clients are doing in times of um, Corona uh, pandemic. And I want to offer this as a framework for our discussion for the, the rest of the panel today and for your planning in, in the weeks ahead. So when we deal with our clients, we are a consultancy for customer centricity and employee centricity, but we work with large multinational organizations around the globe. We see them um, obviously be engaged in a contain mode at the moment in the middle of the pandemic. And we see a few best practices there. Of course, we have to comply with new business, uh, with new government regulations coming our way. We have to protect the uh, employees and our customers. We have to minimize the damage and I will speak about each of these steps on the subsequent slide. Um, in these times, many of our clients approach us though and say, we need to innovate. This is the topic of our um, um, webinar today. We need to change our strategy. We need to break down silos. So I sense a lot of stress within leaders around the globe of doing things that in my opinion, have time to happen later. And I will speak about how in the second phase of this pandemic, hopefully starting in two to six months, once we have a treatment, a pill that helps us overcome a COVID-19 case, once we enter into the second phase of a health risk situation, we can then recover the business and what we need to do then. Um, I will then also speak about best practices in the third phase we're going to look at today. That phase will hopefully come our way in seven to 12 months, maybe a little bit later, and it will start when we have a vaccine at hand that will help us to protect everyone against a COVID-19 infection with the SARS-2 um, virus. So let's double click on what the best practices for each of these phases are, and let's start with where we are today. Um, all countries are still in the pandemic phase. 
So the challenges are to swiftly comply with all new government regulations. I think, oh, you are all in the middle of this mode. You have understood what happens. Germany has published the latest exit steps yesterday. Um, other countries are still tightening up the, the lockdown and the contact bans. So country by country, we need to stay on top of what's coming out as new information. We also need to stay on top of protecting employees and customers as good as we can. This is now the first and foremost we as leaders have to do. Um, only then, but also then, we have to look at minimizing the damage to the assets of our organizations. And these assets reach from perishable goods in the shop next door and the restaurant next door to stock the data, the infrastructure of the large organizations we have represented on today's call. Let me point out two things that might not be too obvious. One is data security. While all of your IT departments are currently busy creating more VPN channels and trying to buy laptops for employees who need to work from home, laptops, the new toilet paper in the B2B segment, you need to make sure together with your IT departments that there is no lack of attention on the IT security, particularly in the industry we're debating today. The second thing that might not be too obvious of things we want to minimize damage to is ongoing non-critical projects. Like in our world, we run the customer centricity projects and the employee centricity projects, voice of the customer programs, that kind of things. And usually organizations have invested a lot of money in these programs. If you now go into a mode where you say, let's completely park this, we will revisit them in November, chances are your programs will have gone sour and you have foregone a lot of investment that has happened for these programs. So while you minimize damage to your assets, also look at your non-critical projects and see how you can keep them on a, on a small burner, on a back burner, but still not let them go cold and, um, and, 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 and perish. The next step is helping others. Um, we all have a responsibility for the communities and the networks we operate in. Be, as a company, a good advisor. Be, as a leader, someone who emphasizes. And be, as an individual, a voice of reason. There's a lot of panic, a lot of rumors, a lot of fake news out there. So maybe now is a time to be a little bit more active on social media and add your voice of reason to the discussion it'll do a lot of good. The next step is adapt to the new situation quickly. Um, you have by now moved your employees into the home office. You have by now created the uh, technical infrastructure for them to work. Now is the moment to adapt your processes and make sure you can come back at least close to former efficiency levels where you were before. Here's the next highlight I'd like to point out. Learn as you go to prepare for the next change. All the things you do right now don't leave you a lot of time, but do take the time to take notes. Where did you get the laptops from? Whom did you need to speak to to get more VPN li licenses? What were some of the unexpected challenges you, uh, you mastered and how did you master them? We will get back to those notes. You will need them on the next and the second slide from here. Try to survive the current situation, understand the government support, and the programs that are out there to help you, have somebody dedicated to understand how to apply for them and try to make sure you're still here when phase three is over. On the bottom of the screen, make sure you communicate to your employees, to your customers, to all of your stakeholders, your neighbors, everyone, because the public is looking to you. They're looking to you and to hear how you are coping as an organization. What do you do as an individual and as a leader? And what can everyone expect from you? Second phase I explained will be the health risk. Here is now the time to recover. Prepare for this phase now because it might come hopefully sooner than we think. This is when we will ramp back up operations as swiftly as possible. We will now provide help and protection to employees and customers by making sure that once our branch is open, we can maintain minimum distances. We can maintain minimum um, uh, sanitation rules and, and, and disinfection rules. Build what has been rebuilt, what uh, has been damaged. 
prepare for this now because in this step, we also have to look at our um, suppliers. Some of your suppliers might not be there when you open your business again. How will you replace them? Where do you source critical services and, and input you need if your suppliers go bankrupt? Mm. The next one is a touchy one because if your employees are in the home office now, chances are some will not come back. If you look at the number of employees we have and the current mortality rate, chances are you will have to deal with losses amongst your employees or amongst your stakeholders. So prepare with your HR teams now how you want to deal with that because employees will closely watch how you deal with it and also how you reward the heroes who helped you overcome the current situation. Prepare for this now and the same as on the previous slide, communicate what is changing. What does hope look like for you? What is your path back to normal? And what can everyone expect from you? The communication bit is very crucial now to uh, instill and maintain trust that your stakeholders have in your brands. The last step then in summary will bring us back into a normal phase. And all of you are business leaders and know that this normal phase will be a short one before the next thing happens. So we need to do a few things here. We need to think up a continuous improvement process. What have we learned from this disaster? How have we reacted? Which KPIs are important for us? And what do we want to monitor in order to be more agile and more resilient against the next thing that comes up? It might not be a virus. It might be labor action in some of our countries. It might be the breakdown of the supply chain in other areas. It might be an IT disaster, a cyber attack, another medical crisis, um, what, you name it. Then train procedures, test new ways, imagine scenarios. This is the core time for innovation now. Think up scenarios and get ready for how you want to deal with them and then prepare for the next big thing to happen as good as you can um, as you know life is happening while we're planning it and again in this uh, phase keep the communication going because folks want to know what you've learned what are you doing to be prepared for the next thing and how can they as your employees your customers and your stakeholders adapt and what can they expect from you so this is the framework we aggregated from speaking to our clients around the globe and from our own observations. I hope you find this useful. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to you, Mary, and to go into our panel discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was a really great overview. I think there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, and I'm excited to dive into that a little bit more and hear from our panelists how they've already started to apply some of these things. Um, so I just sent a message to everybody in the chat. If you have any questions throughout the course of the panel, please go ahead and leave them in the chat and we'll try to get through as many as we can near the end. Um, all right, so let's kick off our, our round table. Um, I've asked everybody to prepare a little bit of an introduction. So I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, each panelist, I'll call you by name, and you can say a little bit about who you are, your organization, where you're, where you're coming from, a little bit of a rundown about the geographic, um, the situation in your geography, about what happened so far with the pandemic, and then any opening remarks that you might have, um, re reactions to Stefan's presentation, and we can get started from there. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started with Janos from MKB. Who is on mute currently? No, I'm not. It's always good to be first. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So my name is Janos Perecesh. It's a hard name to pronounce, and this is a mini beard. I, this, this is a bet, so I don't, normally don't look like this, but uh, until the end of the quarantine, I look like this. And um, I'm leading the digital business uh, line of uh, MKB Bank. MKB is a Hungarian bank. It's a local bank. We are top five, top six in terms of balance sheet. Uh, we are a 70-year-old 70 organization. And uh, we traditionally have been strong in corporate and private banking offering. In the last couple of years, we started a digital transformation program. Uh, in the meantime, um, since uh, 2016, I led actually FinTech Lab, which is the design competence center and accelerator and innovation lab of the bank. But I switched roles uh, as of this February. And uh, now I oversee, I would say, a pretty critical part of our retail business. Uh, so our team represents uh, retail business development, call center marketing, and also digital channels and capabilities. 
so this, these times uh, are really interesting for us. And uh, to be honest, the last couple of weeks uh, has been gone like, uh, like two years of work actually and the, the, like development and uh, actually reacting to the crisis. In Hungary, the situation, I would say, started with uh, closing down the schools on the uh, 13th of March. Since then, we went all remote. Most of the corporates in Hungary uh, did the same. We were actually the first bank to do it uh, for the whole headquarters. So we have been working from home, Mary and I as well. And uh, what we have been focusing on, to be honest, as a, as a, like a beginning remark is that how you can react to do everything to comply with regulations and you know save your employees and make sure that the uh, safe concerns are uh, are actually uh, in, in good hands we call this like mkb of the present so concerning you know what you have to do and what's good and what we did is we launched an initiative uh, we call mkb bank of the future and everything that's actually a proactive re reaction to to the virus in terms of uh, digital developments digital communication you know new organizations and uh, you know new ways of communications inside, outside. Uh, we do this in this new type of project. And I think it's really important to be able to, to do the same. It's actually really hard. So I see the organization and, uh, and most of the people struggle with it, you know, how you can keep going what you have to, what you have to do as a business as usual, but also be able to, to get the benefits, to, to try to get the positive side of this uh, crisis, learn new things and uh, save those things uh, up until you, you are over the crisis. So. I will just kick it off with these this thoughts. I'm really interested in what others are doing and um, what you have uh, discovered during this crisis. Great, thank you, Janos. Let's hear from our other representative from the bank, Daniel. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Um, so um, I, run, I run innovation and FinTech for, uh, for all, all your bank. Uh, Innovation meaning the innovation lab and UX team and UX design team uh, and also the, the, the research part. And FinTech meaning uh, we have the um, uh, CBC fund, uh, partnerships, FinTech partnerships, uh, accelerator, blockchain center of excellence and, uh, and open banking. Mm, and Alior Bank is one of the leading uh, Polish banks, probably similar to, to the size of the uh, of the of the bank that you mentioned uh, just a minute ago, um, in terms of what's happening in the um, uh, in in Poland, I think um, you know probably like everywhere else, right? The government uh, handling situation pretty pretty good, um, responded pretty quickly, closed the borders, uh, brought Poles home. Um, there is a stay-at-home order. Uh, parks are closed. Uh, uh, Schools are closed, so most of the uh, stores are uh, as well closed. And, uh, today is the first day uh, uh, where uh, people are um, asked to wear mask, face mask uh, for um, uh, every time where they are in public. And, uh, so, um, so that's that's the situation in Poland. In terms of the, the 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 opening remarks and and you know how it would look like in the future, I think you know the the scenario that Stefan presented, it's very optimistic scenario uh, to be honest with you. And I would really like to uh, to see this coming as uh, as you mentioned. You have a small you know um, asterisk uh, below your presentation slides that you know those scenarios are not sci scientifically confirmed. Uh, and I would really like this to be really confirmed because you know the timeline looks pretty great, to be honest with you. Um, and you know all the all the tactical elements that you mentioned are also very. Uh, I can relate to that, um, but I think I think the the outlook is uh, is not that optimistic. This is my like personal view. I think we are in a, one of those defining moments, uh, probably one of the biggest in our generation um a, a very specific stress test uh that we have uh right now that uh, something that will bend the values and uh, and things that we believed in um like capitalism for example uh, and and the road to uh to economic recovery will be probably very very long uh, and very tough um, it will probably involve the printing of money. Uh, this is already happening in US uh, and in Europe as well, in Poland. It will probably take uh, two to three years. Uh, 
because of that and also because of the tax uh, taxes, and there will be redistribution of, of wealth uh, uh, in, in our countries, in our economy. And finally, you know, one of the uh, elements in this recovery that we look into it is, um, uh, is the adaptability. It's something that uh, we all looking into it, right? So we responded with uh, adaptability uh, in all those three elements uh, of uh, that, that that Stefan mentioned, and we will be will be doing this going forward, uh, and this will uh, include innovation, creativity. This is something that you know human race is doing pretty good over the the centuries. We can adjust, we can uh, overcome. Um, and uh, we will we'll one day will uh, will will be in a totally new world order, in, uh, in my view. And this will be totally new world, uh, very different to to to, to what we know uh, today. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, I'd I'd love to dig that dig further into that uh, later in the panel about about how, how we can respond, how can we anticipate some of these long-term impacts and, and what the role banks can play in that story. Um, but before we dive deeper, let's hear from our last panelist. Um, Nigel, why don't you introduce yourself and, and share your opening thoughts? Sultan, um, I was formerly uh, head of PR at the Royal Bank of Scotland, which you may recall was pretty famous in the UK for being one of the world's biggest banks and then and a government bailout. So from that point, it was in a quite a long period of sort of perpetual crisis. So we had a lot of experience in managing crisis and how banks respond to them. Unique experience because it was just crisis after crisis. So it's good to see how a bank can evolve and get better and better at that. Uh, currently based in the Middle East, based in Dubai, um, still working with banks. I work with the bank in Saudi Arabia, um, and I work with quite a large uh, global tech company that's based here called Reactor, a Finnish company in Dubai, which is good because that gives the, uh, quite a good insight in the do's and don'ts of innovation as well and, um, and how that works with big traditional companies like banks and something this situation we're, we're all in now is showing about digital capability of banks um, is really really important that's uh, something we're seeing in, in Saudi as well it's something that's I think one lesson I think we're all learning from this is uh, if you've got digital uh, plans to invest is probably to invest a little bit more from this um, in terms of the situation here uh, we went into we've gone into quite a strict down here in the United Arab Emirates very similar situation in Saudi as well and by strict lockdown um, this means you need a permit to leave your house so from a bank's perspective this uh, means that it's down to a very skeleton service of critical workers in offices uh, the regulators obviously recognizing that bank is a critical business so giving permits for that um, but a reduced branch network and and probably like a lot of the other banks around the world is a massive campaign to promote the use of digital banking channels um, and we've seen in Saudi there's been a huge uptake of that um, big big social media campaigns and a big response from customers as well so that's been quite positive. Great thank you and welcome everybody. Um, okay so let's let's dive into some of the questions that we had. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more. So Janos, you started and mentioned that this last month has felt like two years. Um, so let's look at what, what are some of the things, this is a question for Daniel and Janos, what are the, some of the first things that, um, first actions that your banks took? What were some of the things that you were able to achieve in this last month? Can you speak about that a little bit? And Janos, let's have you go first and then Daniel to follow. You know, as I said, if I can, you know, divide those things into two categories, like, you know, reacting and proactivity. On the reacting side in Hungary, there was a, there is a big moratorium on the, the personal lending side. So everything that's credit card, personal loans, uh, overdraft, you don't have to pay until the end of the year, the 31st of December. So as we all know, banks are legacy systems and we are living on legacy systems, even though we replaced that legacy like two years ago. Uh, with a full core transformation this is a lot of work so one of the first actions is actually complying through regulations uh, in terms of uh, you know providing what the law is, requires us to do the second thing was obviously we thought uh, the whole uh, service model i would say so how can the the call center our digital channels and our branches you know can work more tightly with, with other with, with each other you don't have like you know two to two to two two to four weeks to actually wait for feedback from the 
from the branch to, to, to be able to have that information in the call center and translate it into developments for digital channels. So we started to, to introduce new rituals. Um, I think the, in the, the center of these new rituals is transparency and communication. I really liked in the presentation that on the other side that was uh, you know, constantly communicate to stakeholders and, and employees. I think it's, it's really critical. So without having that, that common knowledge, that common belief system, that common culture, cultural uh, you know, value system, I think you, you can't actually win this game. So we started focusing on that with rituals. And on the, on the proactive side, we actually uh, accelerated our digital development. So we introduced uh, like in two weeks, uh, digital queuing in the benches, which is not rocket science, obviously, but it's really important to be able to, to, you know, to have appointments uh, uh, from uh, without going into branches and when you go to the branch you can actually go away and just come back when you have the digital uh, digital ticket and the second thing we introduced is a video chat service so what we saw is that uh, uh, we have a premium customer base which means that uh, the average of our customers is uh, is higher than on the market and they still are you know not exactly comfortable with uh, with all the self service channels we have so we introduced a video chat service where they can actually talk to real, real, uh, uh, real advisors from uh, from the uh, from the branches. And what we're doing is, is obviously a platform. So what we are we are working on in the background is actually developing more and more services on this uh, video chat service and building the capacity. So what it looks like is that you know we have the numbers going down in the branches, the the customers going in, and we have the customers coming into the digital channels, calls and the video chat coming in. So we're actually moving people from the branches to the video chat service, either by using the video chat service in the branch or, or in the headquarters. I think that's, that sums up. Obviously, there is like thousands of things, but I think those are the most exciting and interesting. So Janusz, you, you mentioned a lot of things about uh, you know, what you've, do, you've done for, for the clients. Maybe I can focus on something else, right? So first of all, um, um, responding to this question, right? So first of all, what we've done, in the beginning was we really focused on our employees, right? So we wanted to make sure our board also very uh, reacted very quickly to, uh, uh, to, to the situation. Uh, even before there was any like cases uh, in Poland uh, recognized, we had the travel list restrictions and there was a su the, uh, supplying antiseptic um, products to our branches and, and locations. So that was the first uh, first uh, move from from the board and, uh, and from the anti-crisis uh, team uh, that was um, uh, created during this time. Uh, we also published the you know the safety guidelines for the uh, for the entire bank. Um, wh whoever was possible, uh, whoever could work uh, remotely was encouraged to do so. Um, in in the in the places where it's not possible, uh, the the recommendation was that we should work in shifts uh, or keep uh, and and uh, um, or keep the distance. And so so that was the very strong um, reaction from uh, from the company. Uh, you know, in our office, when once we learned that there is a case in the building that. Uh, uh, that, uh, that someone has a, a virus diagnosed, uh, we decided to close down the office for two weeks. And since then we were, we are, we are remote. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things happening and, uh, and I'm going back to the Steph Stefan presentation in the beginning is over communication, right? We communicate a lot to our, our stakeholders, uh, our employees, you know, frontline employees, back office, you know, everyone. Uh, so, uh, so that's the first things. This communication uh, is very important to to our clients as well, right? So, as as we learn what is happening, we uh, reach to our customers and, and inform them what are the new hours of opening of the branch, right? We were shortened the hours. Uh, and we introduced the special hours for our senior and and uh, elderly uh, clients as well. Um, uh, after that, we launched a specific communication for uh, uh, for the clients how to use the digital solutions, mostly to the you know the people that didn't use the solutions before uh, to learn to do, teach them how to uh, how to use the uh, digital or remote channels. Uh, and it was a difficult and really busy time. I mean, uh, um, and you know, 
also taking into account that there was a lot of misleading uh, and fake news information on social media, right? Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we are a safe pillar in this in this turbulent times. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, thank you both. Now let's let's shift gears uh, for a little bit and look back um, at the previous crisis and what are some of the lessons that we can take away from that. Nigel, you were a part um, uh, of dealing with the 2008 financial crisis and the fallout um, at RBS. What are the, some of the things that you learned there that are applicable to, to today's crisis? And how do you, I remember you mentioned it to me in our conversation that one of the first things you have to do is just figure out What's the right thing to do in this situation? Could you speak to that a little bit more? Pretty simple, just to think of what is the right thing to do. But I think when you're in a crisis, any crisis, um, especially when it starts, there's a huge amount of pressure on the, the people in that organization. And it's very hard for people to think straight and to think clearly. And um, when you're under pressure, you get stressed, um, you start panicking and your IQ drops and that goes for the leadership of the bank as well. Um, that's something we really learned is actually, we found ourselves in the press office sort of telling CEOs that this is what you need to do and sort of <laughs> helping calm people down a bit because uh, your PR team are quite a good tool in this because it's their day job is to deal with little mini crisis on a, a daily basis. So they're quite good at um, thinking about what's the right thing to do. But I think um, having good tools to listen, um, that we mentioned in the early presentation about sort of engaging customers you have social media channels where you have your customers on there and they are incredibly valuable um i found in past uh, we had a particular crisis where the banking system actually the it system went down for i for rbs which is probably one of the worst things that could happen to a bank we didn't know and we couldn't see how much money customers had we're going into branches um so this, the screens were blank so that was a, a real panic happened in the morning I lived by the uh, quite near to the office I ran in I turned all the TV screens on we were on every news channel like BBC Sky um, so like four news channels we were on them uh, being discussed and the social media started to tell us what was going on before really the bank could get itself together and get the right people around the around the table to work that out so I think having really good tools to listen on social media especially at the start of a crisis when things are really sort of like really fast moving is it allows you to see for trends now there's always going to be people complaining about banks on social media but you you want a tool that be able to sort of push that noise aside and see what is emerging now as a trend because it will be no coincidence that some customers start saying something new together that means something is going on and they might they will tell you the truth on so, social media from your customers so Getting a really good reporting tool that actually cuts out the, sort of the BAU type of social media reporting, something that's going to work for your CEO so you can tell them, look, this is a problem or your crisis management team. You can clearly tell you now this has happened in the last hour or this is where there's some customer pain or clearly some system here isn't working. That's really, really important. And similarly as, as well for, I mentioned PR, is having a really good news feed that you can share with your exec as well. So making the right decisions is, is sort of based on knowing your audience. So social media and, and PR, like your, med your customers go to the media to complain, but they're also key stakeholders in your reputation. And the same with politicians, they will use the media or they will be, um, um, they will be making comments about you as well. And they're, they've all sort of got your reputation in your hands here. So in your crisis mode, especially something like this, um, where it's, there's a big economic impact, then banks are very much part of the story. So whatever play you make or even if you don't make a play can have a big reputational impact so I think um, it's good to sort of really think really think clear and to think uh, what is the right thing to do is well is how can we help what's the best way we can help and certainly I think we learned in the past is you can't go at this sort of piecemeal you have to go really big and if you go here's a little bit of help we could probably really do more but this is easy let's do this you'll get called out for it you customers Customers call you out for it, um, especially in the UK, where you've got a very fierce media, where banks are really not liked. Uh, you certainly get they're, they're waiting for you to make mistakes, and they'll call you out on that stuff. So I think, yeah, and also um, empathy is really, really important. And and again, ha having these tools that listen to the outside will keep you connected. To that because in a crisis, the first response is to panic about, okay, how does how do we keep this bank on the road? 
where we can't get people into the offices and stuff. So yes, you've got to look at that, but at the same time, what's being said about you and there's, at any time there's a conversation going on about you on social media, but in a crisis, a, a much bigger one. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say, yeah, just having those tools as well is just, I think um, just having a really good, a really good PR team that's a really good advisor, I think, with that influence. Great, yeah, I think um, we can all agree that it's important to kind of keep a pulse on what's going on with your customers. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to turn it back to, to Daniel and Janos for a second and just ask you, how are you seeking input from your customers in this time? Have you started any new initiatives? Um, how are you keeping the customers in the center of everything that you're doing? And let's go ahead and let's start with Daniel. Okay. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a lot of things that we are doing, to, to be honest with you, uh, in terms of the um, trying to hear the voice of our customers. So we have a in our in our department we have a lab um, and the lab really operates um, business as usual right so of course we don't have a responders coming to to our lab and and uh, and giving us the you know impressions of our apps and you know how they interact with them but we move to the digital we are uh, we are making connections digitally and and asking our clients how they um, you know how what is their sentiment how they feel about it uh, what is the what their yeah. daily problems main concerns and, you know main fears uh, so so that's definitely something that we uh, look into it um, the, there is a big flaw in this process right now um, I'm telling you why, right? Because normally those kind of research, you don't even do like close to the bigger holidays, for example, like Christmas, Thanksgiving, you don't do, you know, those kind of um, uh, research exercises with them. And now we are in the middle of the crisis, right? So you have the customers actually, uh, you know, suffering at this moment and we are asking them. So we, uh, we assume and uh, like maybe the, the, the outcome from this research will be not as clear as, uh, uh, as we hope, but it's something definitely uh, what, we can, uh, what, what we can build on. As an, and, and as a response to that, uh, we are launching the special initiative of our accelerator. Uh, we are launching the fast track uh, of this accelerator partnership program where we will be looking for the startups and partners and solution providers that can um, quickly, uh, fast uh, and on a scale um, help, uh, and help our customers and, and create impact. Um, and uh, yeah, we are launching this with the one of, with Pesa Tool, which is one of the biggest, um, I think, the biggest uh, insurance and banking group in the CE region. So we also also want to uh, leverage the the scale of our organizations, and uh, and yeah. So if you uh, happen to be a startup and listening to this uh, um, um, to this panel, uh, there is a link. I can share the link later on. And we are uh, we are looking for applications by the uh, 26th of uh, April. So uh, please join this because I think uh, together we can do uh, something good for um, for for a lot of people. Great, right, thanks, Daniel. And yeah, Janos, let's hear from you about how we're talking to customers at MKB, and also if, um, you want to segue into this topic as well. Some of the longer term new initiatives that we're doing to deal with the crisis as. Well. Yeah, obviously. So, so what, what my my thoughts were where Daniela was uh, was talking is that what well, how we reacted is that we didn't start any new initiatives to get more feedback. What we did is that we started new initiatives to be able to quicker to gather those feedbacks. So you know, like in the last couple of, last couple of months, we've been working on a strategy we call customer experience strategy. Everybody has that one. Now we have one as well. But one of the main findings uh, of our internal interviews and the work we have been doing was that we have so many data inside MKB, you know, like, like it's tre treasure, like it's, it's, a, it's treasure hunt. You go to contact center, you go to a branch, you go to the treasurers, the, the, the sales guys in, in you know, the, the, the telemarketing guys. And what we, had, what we started to focus on actually before the crisis and in the crisis as well is to, to be able to quickly aggregate that data and to actually make decisions, you know, like in a, in a quicker sense. 
and not come up with new methods or, or new new tests or usability tests, things like that, but actually be able to, to gather those data uh, quickly and uh, aggregate that quickly and then make decisions and then build that in into the next deployment, for example. Like, uh, I won't go into specific details, but you know, like it, it's not always proactive uh, building up stuff, but sometimes you realize something doesn't work for the customer in your mobile app, and then you have to react. You don't always have to build something new, but actually, you know, like make something uh, that you made a bad decision a couple of years ago. And your second question was, what, what are the, some of the longer term projects? Well, to be honest, there isn't a lot of new projects or things that we're working on. What we're trying to do is, um, what we have been struggling with in the last couple of years is actually doing everything in projects and not as business as usual. So what we are, what we started to focus on uh, since February, since uh, we have this new department and then the, the area in the bank is how you can make projects are new business as usual. You know, I don't want to go into details of the agile and new way of working because obviously everybody reads that, everybody tries that, but we're also trying to, to implement some of the best practices and uh, actually let the teams, the team of teams come up with what we have to do. We help them, you know, like with the common knowledge, the common belief system. What we try, what we're working on hard is to actually, you know, make them able to make their own decisions. Obviously working on some de developments or mobile application, we're working on new features for the video chat, but there is nothing uh, rocket science here. You're just listening to the customers and then, you know, have the teams uh, work on things that will actually make them happier. So Janusz, I, I can, if I can add to that, you know, the, yeah. when you were talking about the long term, I uh, was uh, start to think, can we really think about long term in those kind of situations? No. Right? We are in the middle of some very weird public, you know, experiment when uh, there is no clear outcomes, right? So uh, I think we should, you know, act on whatever is necessary today and help you know the ease the burden that our clients have and then once we are in the third phase of uh, of this uh, recovery then we can think about uh, new order but i think now it's just it's impossible to think in a really long term even mid terms seems to be unrealistic right now i think what we can focus on have to focus is actually like you know keeping the talent and not just not just healthy because that's that's like it's number one but obviously keeping them happy and motivated and, uh, you know, like, because when there will be a time when we can think more than six weeks and then they have to be ready. But one of the things actually uh, about the previous question of Mary about the crisis, I was just an outsider. I was still in university when the crisis hit in 2007, 2008. But what I see from our bank and some of the banks in Hungary is that it's not actually what we can learn from the last crisis because it's completely different, but how can we actually forget the things that we learned in the last 12 years, you know? Because there are some reactions that because, oh yeah, because in the last crisis, so that's because you can't do that because that's the lowest since the last crisis. And what, we, what is really hard is to you know, unlearn those things because learning new things is really easy and learning the, 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 the old things is the hard part. But it obviously there are learned, learned things to learn, but what I'm learning is that unlearning is the learning here now. Great, thank you both. Um, great exchange of ideas there. Um, I'd like to switch now. We got some questions coming in from the chat, so let's go ahead and move to there. Um, Janos and Daniel, you guys are very popular according to our chat here. So a uh, question for you both. Um, how is your bank helping clients better understand and protect their financial situation? For example, depletion of reserves and learn about available solutions. What kind of advice are you providing to your clients? Janos, I guess you had a you you made a gesture, so you can go first on this one. I have to read the, the question once again. It's not an easy one because that's what I'm saying. Like it feels like two years, but it's actually four to six weeks. Actually, f five weeks in Hungary, for example, since going full remote. So there is there is not you, you you can't change a whole bank or a whole like digital system in like in five five weeks. But what we're focusing on is. Uh, is uh, we obviously we started uh, with a landing page on our on website and this, this is the main point of contact uh, with the deeper in, in deeper information uh, for self-service for our customers we have a team that's actually just focused on uh, uploading uh, news and uh, and uh, fresher and fresher uh, faqs and you know how you how they can they can uh, uh, reach us and as i said uh, in hungary there's a big question now 
because we have this moratorium. It's actually not just for uh, a personal lending. I was uh, I was mistaken uh, last time. It's for every every loan. They don't have to even if it's a corporate or or a, or a retail customer. They don't, don't have to pay until the end of the year. And one of the big questions now, if you're a, if you're a customer of us, is that should I pay or should I not pay? And um, what we have been focusing on is actually helping our customers make that decision. Obviously, we can't that can't make the decision instead of them, but providing uh, you know like calculators and uh, useful data how they can make a decision. What we see is that uh, most of our retail customers, not most, but more than one third of our retail customers, uh, keep on paying the, the loans. Some wait, you know, to to see what will happen. And um, it's the the small SMEs. They are uh, the ones who hesitate. You know, they they have the liquidity. Uh, uh, problems more like the retail customers now. So, so we ran in all your bank. We um, responded to this uh, uh, on a lot of levels. We also have a credit moratorium for our clients. Uh, but you know, I think banks and our bank as well will have the crucial, really crucial role in the distribution of public funds. So, um, and our bank is playing the, the key role in this process. Uh, so we support business clients with getting the working capital uh, loans guaranteed by the uh, Polish government. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we understand our clients. We, we, uh, we uh, meet with them every day. I mean, we understand the financial standpoint. And with that knowledge, we we can uh, build recommendations uh, for the future uh, and we'll have the the crucial role in this pandemic i guess not not only our bank but you know the banking sector in general uh you know going back to the 2008 uh, back then it was only banks but now is the the whole economy not only banks so not only banks need to be supported we have uh, but also the entire entire uh, entire economy And just one comment because um, so it's the same in Hungary as well. Now we have new and new and new programs coming up. You know, like uh, public money available through like basically free loans. And um, one example is what we're trying to do is, um, you know, most of corporate lending is still physical. So you have to like you know go into the branch uh, like at least two to three times to actually get the loan. So what we started to work on is how we can move it into either a video chat or some sort of self-service channel. But I completely agree with Daniel that. It's it's sometimes is to forget how critical banks uh, the, the, the the critical role we play in uh, in this in this whole whole situation. So I'm actually really proud to be to be the, to be in a bank right now because it's really exciting how we can actually, you know, not just be there for the customers but you help our customers. So it's going to be an exciting times. Um, great, thank you, um, Nigel. I just wanted to check in with you if you had any thoughts on that question as well, because you have experience working with a few different banks um, about just kind of generally the role banks can play in, in this time and any, any thoughts there? I think it's, uh, well, it's a massive economic problem. So the banks are like absolutely crucial uh, to this. I think um, it's a very difficult job for banks now. I think uh, it sounds like most banks now have done some sort of stimulus package it's about now, like I said before, is watching to see what is the next issue um, and thinking maybe on a, like a monthly basis. I think the real, in a crisis, many of the crises have dealt with before and, and same here is a lot of focus goes on small and medium sized businesses, obviously, because certainly in the UK, that's a big backbone of the economy, but anywhere they hold it, they create and hold a lot of jobs. So I think um, focusing really hard on them is really important. So. Some of them might be fine for this month, but next month, are they gonna be able to survive? Uh, I mean, in normal times, good businesses fail because they simply run out of cash. So um, we, this is probably like a real concern here is this, and then obviously that drives the unemployment up. So it's a case of really maybe going through really diligently uh, how you support an SME and looking at, are there, are we doing absolutely everything we can within our power to support them? Are we making, is there anything we're doing that's making life harder for them? Um, and just really take a really honest look at stuff. And the same obviously for individuals as well. I think banks have a, a big role here now to do what they can to try and give people and businesses as much financial peace of mind as they can. There's a, certainly, I think in this part of the world where we've gone 
into a lockdown and we've gone into that quite a while away. There's having quite a psychological effect on people and um, people are really worried about how long this is going on. And one thing a bank can do is make the money tr troubles uh, uh, less, one less thing to worry about. Great, moving on to the next question from the audience. Um, Janos and Daniel again. Have you seen a large uplift of digital channels, users who weren't using them before? Have you had to change how you operate um, for legal entities or have their requirements changed? Daniel, you're up. <laughs> Reading the question again. Yeah, I mean, we see the uplift in the digital channels, definitely. Uh, maybe and uh, you know i cannot uh, share the details but what we see you know the lot of customers to, uh, don't go to the branches they they use the um, the phone to contact uh, with the bank which is great uh, but it also creates a problem right in the bank right so i mean not a problem but uh, the challenge in the bank uh, to uh, to really deal with such a volume uh, of incoming calls uh, so we definitely see the changes in behaviors, uh, and uh, but I don't really understand the second part of the question. Do we do we have to operate for the the legal? Entity? I'm assuming it's about regulation. If there's been some oh, um, relaxation yeah. about regulation. Sure. So so uh, the Polish regulator um, actually. Uh, ask the banks and financial institution to keep uh, their um, income uh, that was uh, last year uh, to make sure that we have the capital needed for the kind of times to come so for example that was the the, the definitely something that was imposed and, um, some of the regulations and executions of the uh, of the directives uh, that was needed to be uh, executed pretty quickly that was delay as well uh, we didn't need to do much uh, uh, to be honest with you but we just need to comply with those regulations yeah no quick um, answer from your side yeah, I think it's pretty much the same like uh, digital channels we've seen an uptick of the average usage for like 20 20 30 percent in, in terms of the the usage but one interesting uh, follow of Daniel is actually yeah like you know, the average customer like who, who doesn't use the digital bank, they don't go to the, the mobile app, they actually use the phone. And we also have some challenges, I would say, you know, like moving people into the, to the call center to actually be able to answer those calls. And um, the reason I'm mentioning this is that this is a pretty good example of how you have to be able to break down those silos. So with what, what we did, as I mentioned, is we moved the branch officers into, into the call center. And this is real time when you can't really, you know, like, just only... It's your problem, you solve it, but you have to really be really proactive and open about breaking down those silos and not in like a three month program, but by tomorrow. So it's, it's really interesting to see that. And that's also a really great segue into the next question. Um, so as you break down silos and try to move fast, move fast and break things, you could say. So a question from Valentina, digital service developments, which had to go through a longer approval process are now introduced more quickly these days. So for example, in cash management services, paperless approvals, et cetera. How risky do you consider these quick decisions related to the quick digitalization and how can we reduce this risk? I can go first. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's hard because I'm I'm the one the, in the in the bank who is now breaking the things. There's always someone you know who who breaks the things and someone tries to you know, to hold on to the things. But I think there's a balance. So I think you can still move fast without not breaking the important things. So obviously, even if you could make a decision without involving legal and and and, and risk, you wouldn't do that. It's it's stupid. So what what we, what we try to do is that we try to how to say this like uh, decrease the circle, I would say. So the, the average typical approval process and you know, like commenting process is like 30 people on, on, a, on an email. Hey guys, this is, the, this is what I've done. Please comment on that. And you wait for five days to, to have all the comments. And we, we try to introduce like rules, rules, you know, like only one people from legal, only one people from risk. And then if they are actually able to make the decision and they, they're brave enough to make a decision, then you come more forward. But obviously we'll see it in two to three years if we make some mistakes, not tomorrow. So far, so good from our side. I'm, I'm positive that uh, you can find the balance. 
Uh, very quickly, because I think we are running out of time, probably shortly. Um, um, I think, you know, security is one of the things uh, why customers uh, trust banks, right? And this is the, the trust is the, the biggest currency that we have. Uh, so we don't think even about reducing the risk in, uh, in, our, in, in, in any process that we are running, even though that sometimes the solutions are really needed um, and uh, there was a void, there's a void to do it. But, um, but what is interesting to see, you know, how those projects that we have somewhere in the pipeline came up to the top of the list. And once you know everybody is working in the organization on, on those projects, how quickly they can turn out to be products um, and available to the clients. And just recently, we launched uh, the verification uh, method, the verification, verification uh, solution, photo ID to our clients, so they can uh, um, do remote um, activation of, of, of the uh, of the channels and solutions. So, uh, and we are working with our portfolio company, our CBC portfolio company, Autenti, to launch the uh, digital signature and process automation uh, projects as well. So when, you know, everyone is on board and every hand's on, on, on the deck, then things can move pretty quickly. And this is something that, uh, that I think the organization really learned uh, over the, the, this period of time. Great. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're about out of time, so I don't want to open the floor for another question. Um, we got through about half of them, it looks like, but um, this hour went by really quick. I think we're just scratching the surface of this topic. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody for participating today. Thank you, Stefan, for that great intro presentation. Thank you, Janos, Daniel, and Nigel, our great panelists. Thank you for your bravery in being able to speak about this. Um, to be honest, we'd reached out to quite a few banks in trying to set this up, and it was really difficult to get um, authority really to speak on some of these topics and, and get people's time because, as you know, it's, you know, it's a crazy intense period for everyone, but I think it's important that we stop and, and look back and exchange some ideas on this topic. So thank you all very much for your willingness to do that. Thank you for our audience um, for joining us and our co-host, Arcade Global. Um, I think it was a great session. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. And um, yeah, good luck to everybody in all that you're doing. Stay focused, keep up the good work, and hopefully we'll be back to some sort of a new reality at some point soon. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Stay Thank safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.